<clears throat> right, so how many dimensions are there? So this is a subject a lot discussed, and the reason why I've done this is because I somehow got on, got involved in a discussion group recently in which people were making a lot of comments about this. They're nearly all to absolutely no purpose whatsoever, so I thought let's have a bit of clarity. Hang on, what's that one? It's not moved my thing on. What's that one? That's the one. Right. So what, what are dimensions all about? Well, they're certainly all about orthogonality, and they're all about Pythagorean addition. In other words, squares of numbers. And squaring seems to have a special relevance. We had the, uh, Lou just uh, telling us about the uh, quadratic Hamiltonian, and it seems that the quadratic is very important in physics more than anything else. So it's got a special relevance. Um, so we measure, our measurements are all based on counting numbers, integers. Can't really imagine counting without having any integers. Now, we know that every sum of integers gives an integer, so we can have a complete progression and, and set up our measuring system that way. There's an infinite symbol, sequence of integer sums, the integers are expressed as integer sums, and this is the basis of all observation. There's no meaning to observation unless you can actually count. However, um, if we look at numbers, the, there is another alternative to simply counting numbers, and that's to use Pythagorean triplets. And there's an infinite sequence of these, uh, there's an infinite sequence of sums of squares of integers that themselves squares of integers. And we can always find, to any squared integer, we can always find another squared integer that will give another squared integer when we add them together. And this is, this is what number factorization is about, for example, that's how we would do it down there. Just the difference of two squares, and if a minus b is a factor of c, then we can set up such a number. And we can therefore always create an infinite sequence of Pythagorean connections with larger and larger numbers. So it's another way of expressing the factorizability of integers. But this is impossible for any exponent greater than two, as we know. There's not even a single instance of it in the whole of arithmetic. You can't add up any cubes or any fourth powers or anything of that kind. It simply cannot be done. And so it seems that squaring and Pythagorean in, in addition are actually fundamental to a, a arithmetical operation. And in some sense, a uniquely valid alternative way of constructing an infinite sequence of divisions in an infinite measuring scale. So it's an, an alternative to just using integers is to use squared integers. It's a counting ladder similar to regular numbers, but with its own rules and in the same way as uh, regular numbers define their own rules. So I think this is really the ultimate meaning of dimensionality. This is why we have it. This is why it's squared and this is why squares are important in physics. So if we can set up such a system, then the things that separate these two infinite series will become significant integers and squares of integers. And this, the fact that they are separate, and they're not the same method of counting, means that we can set up the condition of orthogonality. Because in orthogonality, the squared numbers don't add up in the same way as the regular ones. Sometimes squared numbers are possible, and, the, and regular ones aren't. And that's what we mean by orthogonality. So, th this is, we think is the condition. Uh, that that uh, creates dimensions. Now, of course, the intuitive idea that there are three dimensions of space is ancient, possibly millennia in, in origin. And same as Pythagoras' theorem, that's, that's certainly very old indeed. Uh, and the first idea of orthogonality, though, comes a bit later, I think. It doesn't actually come from dimensions in the same way. The, the idea that things are orthogonal and not just... Uh, I mean, Pythagoras theorem is orthogonality, but I don't think you realise immediately that that's what it is. To understand the orthogonality of real numbers, 
we have really to look at a different kind of number. We've got to look at imaginary numbers, ones that are squares of, uh, uh, that lead to negative squared numbers. Now, imaginary numbers are incommensurate with real ones, though the squared ones are not, and that is classic example of orthogonality. And so it immediately uh, forces it to defining an orthogonality. Truly orthogonal dimensions are incommensurate <coughs> as the addition, but commensurate for squared addition. And this is exactly what we get with imaginary numbers. So we, we, we can actually use the fact that they're like, they're very similar to two dimensions in the Pythagorean sense, so we can use Pythagorean two dimensions to represent them. So this is what we use in the Argon diagram with horizontal real, vertical imaginary. But, but we don't get Pythagorean addition out of it. What we have to do is use a, a special multiplication combining the real and imaginary numbers using the complex conjugate. So we can't do it by direct Pythagorean addition. But it is a kind of analogy to it. So if we're like, the real and imaginary numbers are, are a kind of two-dimensional representation, but it's not a standard one. It's not the same as the two-dimensional aspect of three-dimensionality in space. And this distinction is a very important one in physics, and it will continue to be so. Now, if we look at dimensionality of space, this is our intuitive understanding, it tells us that these dimensions are distinct and orthogonal, the, 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 we have three distinct and orthogonal dimensions, but each have the identical properties. There's nothing different about them, which is quite different from adding real and imaginary numbers, which are also distinct uh, from each other. And this is a, uh, the, the uh, real and imaginary is a kind of broken symmetry, whereas the ordinary three dimensionality of space is not a broken symmetry, it's a, a real symmetry. So, it's the, but interestingly, it's the broken symmetry which gave us the first clue into the meaning of the real perfect symmetry. And this uh, is the discovery of quaternions in 1843 by Hamilton. Hamilton realized that he discovered the meaning of three-dimensionality. He was the first to actually get any clue into it. And it's still the only clue we have into it. It's still the only way in which we can understand that three-dimensionality is really special in some way. And what he was trying to do was extend the complex numbers into the third dimension. He had the argon diagram in front of him and he wanted to extend it into three dimensions. So he proposed to draw a third axis, z-axis, so the one coming out at you, perpendicular to the other two, which would contain, we couldn't contain real numbers because they were all on the horizontal axis. You make the distance a bit more. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That, like that. Yeah. They couldn't uh, contain all the real numbers because these are all on the x-axis. So he, he wanted numbers on the on another axis, and obviously has, the only other option is to do a different system with imaginary numbers. So if instead of using i's we use j's, then see if that works. And of course it doesn't work as we know. And the reason why it doesn't work is there's no such thing as the product ij within that system. So if we look at that diagram, that's what he tried to do on the left. He tried to find a system in which there was real numbers and two imaginary numbers, but the two imaginary numbers multiplied together didn't give anything that made any sense within the system. So eventually, after a lot of trouble, he, he created a system of three imaginary numbers which was cyclic. Uh, but to do so, he had to do something that violated a cardinal principle of Algebra is then known, which is the principle of commutativity. The fact that A, B, and B, A were the same thing. A, B could, in this system had to be minus B, A. And this was, so this, this was a breaking the rules of algebra as then known. He removed the real axis, had three imaginary axes, with units all different from each other, but all equating to root minus one, and follow, following a rotation cycle, giving us those rules, I, J equals K, K, I equals J, J, K equals I. So he now had a closed algebra with four basic units, which he called quaternions. But one is the fourth unit, but in double the size of complex algebra, and four times the size of real algebra. And the question was, can we do, do that again? Can we say, 
push it up to another dimension, say, let's make L another version of I, J, K, another, and, and, and in fact you can't. And this, was, this theorem was proved by Frobenius in 1878, that you can't do that. And if you try it, if you're just trying it out with a, a pen and paper, you can quickly find out you can't do it. But the proof is quite difficult. Now the threeness isn't the primary cause of the three-dimensionality of space, it's really anti-commutativity that does it. So that's the key thing, it's not three dimensions, it's anti-commutative dimensions that are really important. If we have two axes anti-commutative with each other, then we can't draw any other axis that's anti-commutative with them, unless it's ij. So we can't make up another one, you know, if we wanted to, we can't do it. We also call ij as k. So it's anti-commutativity that forces the three-dimensionality, and this explains the strange arbitrariness of dimension three. Now, if we have commutative things that A, B equals B, A, and so forth, then we could extend to I, J, K, L, M without limit. We could have an infinite number of dimensions that were commutative. And I like to think of it as anti-commutative things know about each other's existence, but commutative things don't. So I always knows that it's a partner of J and K, but it doesn't know about anything else. And anything that's commutative simply doesn't know that anything else exists. I, I'm a little confused about what you mean by the anti-commutative things know about each other. I think you're assuming something else, because we can do Grossman algebra, for example, where well, it's not a division algebra dimensions and the anti-commute. Well, yeah, that's not a division algebra. Produce many I'm, other directions. I'm basing the algebra on numbers. Division algebra. I'm not basing it on anything else. You you can actually make up other rules. Yeah. You could you can you can create other algebras based on other rules. But this is an extension of numbers. Of this is a division algebra. That's what I'm arguing. Well, what here. assumption are you making? Well, I'm what, it, what assumption are you making that you have to have a, uh, another direction that you call k for i j and that it closes? You're assuming that the algebra closes. Yeah, you're assuming the division algebra. You're assuming that, three, but you're assuming so that, that, that you get divisors. Arbitrarily, three came out because you assumed it closed at three. Yeah, that's correct. No, you didn't. So you didn't derive three. I didn't derive three. Someone else did. Like, this, this, this isn't my mathematics. This is standard. I'm, I'm simply quoting the official standard line on it. I mean, it seems to me that what force three was something else, namely you wanted a division algebra and you got one. Yeah. But, and you wanted it to be associative and you got one. Yeah, well, we're coming to that. With all that, you were forced into three plus one. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, okay. That's what I'm saying. Exactly what I'm saying. You, you've got two, two conditions. You've got division algebra and associativity. Well, I haven't mentioned Nancy associative yet. So, it, it, so it works well, but it re requires a reversal of sign when we reverse the order of multiplication. Trivial to show that, because we, if, for example, we take the product i, j, j, i, multiply the j's out, you get minus one, the, you, you, you're left with minus i, i, you can easily show that's one, so therefore i, j, and j, i can't be the same. There's just one exception, and this is what I was going to bring up, is that if you break another uh, rule, associativity, which is a, b times c is the same as a times b times c, then you can actually create a, an algebra with seven imaginary components, which we call octonions. Now the trick can't be repeated again. If you want a division algebra, if you want it to be a number algebra, a division algebra, then you've got to have one of these four. These are the only four, and those are the, the uh, Norm means the, the unit is squares to one. Norm means the unit is squares to minus one. And also, these three higher algebras are not totally compatible. Um, it, the eight dimensions of octonians don't completely contain the four of quaternions uh, as a subset, nor, nor the two of complex algebra. It's, it's not as simple as that you can just extend the algebra, that they have differences. No. And the kind of dimensional found, found in space is that of a non-conserved quantity. This is very important. The, uh, uh, this is a very important aspect when people are talking about extending the dimensions of space. 
They often ignore this. Uh, space is a non-conserved quantity. It's got affine structure and rotation symmetry. Uh, affine structure means that you can endlessly uh, recreate the, the, the dimensions as long as you get the same result from them. Uh, there's, there's no fixed set of three dimensions. There's, there, you have to have three dimensions, but you can do it any, any number of ways you want, endlessly. And you can't actually stop space doing that. It's not that you can make the choices. Space can make any choices it wants. And it, also, there's rotation symmetry between the dimensions. You can't actually you can exchange one for another. You can't just pick anything you want. So, this kind of dimensionality found in space, characteristic of a non conserved quantity, uh, can only exist for three dimensions unless the system is anti commutative. And even then, it's only for seven dimensions. So, you just can't push space out to be whatever you want. You can't say, I want ten dimensions of space or space and time. You can't do it. It's not mathematically possible. You cannot extend space as we know it to nine dimensions. What you could do is embed the three dimensions of space in a higher dimensionality, but, you, but they can't be extended to become one thing. It, it's, it's, it would then be a more complicated structure. And that's is just this, mathematical. Is this a, is this a uh, absolute uh, yes. Yes, reputation absolutely. of string theory then? Um, no. Uh, it's, oh, we'll come to string theory. theory. It is a refutation of what many people think of as string theory <laughs> and push the, uh, the idea that you can just have as many spatial dimensions. You can't. It's just nonsense. But if, if we want space as we know it to be part of something bigger, then you can't just make it nine of, nine of the same. So when you speak of extending space, you mean and carrying the algebra structure. Yeah, space. exactly. That for you, when you speak of space, it, it, is, it has to have that algebra structure. Yeah, to me it has to, because it's not space otherwise. It's not space as we know it. I'm saying we can't expand, extend space as we know it and add another six dimensions. It cannot be done. There is no way of doing it. What you can do is you can embed it into something that's got six other dimensions of some other kind, but you can't just say, let's make space nine-dimensional. It's complete nonsense. You can't say the other dimensions are rolled up either. That's right. You can't. That's, 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 you're absolutely right there. What I'm saying is you can't do that because, because all the dimensions have got to be the same if it's like space. And they've also got to be rotation symmetric and they've got to be affine. They've got and, to have a metric between space, yeah, three you, space and that. Right? So you can't just say, let's have space and roll up some of the dimensions. That's complete nonsense. But doesn't this depend a lot on your definition of dimension? I mean, That's what I'm saying. You, you, I'm saying you can't have it as we know it. You have to have a new definition of dimension if you want to do that. Well, by as we know it, you mean as, as the rules observe. of algebra yeah. specify. As a space as we have it now, we cannot multiply by three. You know, and, and the, it would be the same. It, you, and we would preserve that bit of space the same. It wouldn't be. But we can do other things. I'm not denying we can do other things, but we can't do that. If I assume that three dimensions is a property of the display system that we are biologically endowed with, I can certainly imagine us evolving into some systems that allow us to visualize four dimensions or five well, dimensions. I, we can't. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's not algebraically possible. possible. However, we can do other dimensional tricks, and I'll show you. We'll, we'll do that. Tricks. Well, they're not tricks, but they're not, they might, might, be, might be useful tricks. But we can't actually just say, let's push it out to nine. So I, I guess I have to object on the grounds of classical topology in as much as we, we, the standard <coughs> usage of space is, has been abstracted from any algebra that might be associated with it. Yeah, sure. I mean, you, you, can, you can do topologies and, and geometries and things, but you can't actually do a division algebra extension. And the division algebra is important for us for measurement and observation. And that's what I'm swing, saying. You can't swing your ruler into these extra yeah. dimensions. You can only, you, the ruler stays in three. I'm saying the, the, the application of vision algebra to space is crucial for physical purposes where measurement and counting, no. counting are fundamental processes. No. So if we talk about measurement and counting and things like that, we can't do it. But you, but certainly you can draw four-dimensional, five-dimensional spaces and so on. But, but that is not what is our spaces. Anyway, so the, the kind of dimensionality of phone space, characters of a non-conserved quantity with an affine structure and rotation symmetry dimensions, can only exist for three dimensions 
unless the system is also anti-commutative. And, and even then it can't exist for more. That's what I was saying there. So, its dimensions can't be fixed. They're endlessly reconstructable, irrespective of our attempts to fix them. And we can't privilege some dimensions with respect to others if we want our space to be extended. We can't just say, oh, those, those dimensions are different. We can't do that because it's a non-conserved quantity. All the dimensions have to be equivalent. We can't make some more equal than others, as it were. So the dimension does have the freedom to transform into each other without separating out some particular dimensions to which it doesn't apply. We can't do it. Now, let's, go, let's uh, recall the different ways that we've represented two and three dimensions. This is a profound difference in the most fundamental symmetries of the art of nature. Two-dimensionality reflects the duality. Three reflects anti-commutativity. And the tension between these two symmetries, which to some extent I, I consider is like cons conservation and creation, goes a long way towards explaining large parts of physics, biology, and the rest of it. It's because these are not the same. Two-dimensionality is not a, a bit of three-dimensionality. Not, not truly, because that two-dimensionality isn't two-dimensionality. The two-dimensional no uh, complex numbers can't be extended to 3D, while the 3D represented quaternions doesn't truly incorporate a 2D. You can't separate out 2D and say, that's, let's just keep that part as a separate. That's what Hamilton tried to do and failed. Lines, areas, and all that in space that couldn't be represented without an underlying 3D structure. They're not 1D or 2D, they're 3D representations of 1D and 2D, which is quite different. And so also, 3D and anti have also incorporated something special into nature, the idea of discreteness. They actually create this closure, and the closure creates discreteness. And in nature, it seems to me that all discreteness comes from anti-commutativity. And I will actually say something here. All discrete things are three-dimensional in some respect. Now, if dimensions are defined through anti-commutativity, then the number of dimensions will always be restricted to four, uh, if we ignore anti-associativity. If we suppose that the commutative link could go on to infinity, but well, we could just simply put spaces where we uh, part various things and uh, consider them orthogonal. Things like a Hilbert space, for example, is of that nature. So, so Peter, you said three uh, you know, anti-commutativity implies three dimensions in that. Yeah. Where, where does the fourth one come from? On well, that's, that's the that's when I say four. That's the uh, the fourth part of the quaternion, the real part. In oh, fact, okay. what I'm going to say, it's, it's, a double, it's a double connection, it's, it's anti-commutativity and uh, okay. duality okay. to make it, you can't do it without both. So, uh, I'm going to say, you can argue that three dimensions are part of a large, larger four dimensionality, as the quaternion name would suggest. But you can't even think of the three dimensional units without having a real one, um, even though you can't draw the, one, the real one on the diagram. Well, this one isn't, is different from the other three, you can't absorb it into those axes. Axes. Uh, the, the, the three axes of the IJK are interchangeable, but the one isn't interchangeable with them. So the relationship is again a broken one, like the real and imaginary complex numbers, which is what it is. It's a, it's a duality relationship. Now, uh, if we go back now to quaternions, this is historical importance. That they're, they're norm one, and that put people off using them at, at the end of the 19th century. And so we're still a, a step away from explaining spatial dimensions. We've got dimensions, but spatial dimensions. Uh, well, Hamilton actually did develop this uh, idea. He developed the quaternion idea. Um, since they're distinct from ordinary complex numbers, we can actually add complexity to it and, and create new sets. So we, if we add a, compl a complex complexification to IJKM1, we will, I will appear as a unit, and also these will appear as units. So we will in fact complexify um, the whole thing. And uh, uh, we've, I've mentioned this before in one of my earlier talks, uh, these create what we now call multivariate vectors. So th th these are the rules for that algebra. Uh, and th this is writing them in this form, the bold symbols for these multivariate vectors. You'll notice that you now have an eight-dimensional space yes, um, yeah. with associativity, but not, not division. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's not a division algebra. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a. What this is now is um, it is a broken symmetry. It's not a true eight-dimensional. It's a, it's a broken symmetry. So, um, so the object I mentioned before had all the properties required of vectors that except that they had the extra property which eventually merged as spin. And in fact, uh, nowadays, uh, I'll, I'll leave that out, it's just power matrices. Uh, they have, real vectors are these quantities. They're not actually just as we used to use them in standard textbooks. They are act actually these quantities. So we know that in addition to the vector scalar, the full algebra requires pseudo vector quality uh, areas. Uh, so it's fundamental in this way, uh, but in, in another sense, it's eight dimensional, as you, you just said, Luke, uh, in effectively including the quaternion algebra and requiring a total of eight ortho orthogonal units. So the, the algebra of those, um, of the, sorry, the, I don't think I've written it, but the, the complexified vectors, these things, that those, is in fact a quaternion algebra. But now we've gone down a route which makes the whole idea of dimensionality much more problematic. Uh, we've effectively combined two, uh, two different dimensional systems which individually are compatible. We've got the quaternions with their anti-commutativity and we've got the complex numbers with their duality. And we've put those together and they're not totally compatible. The, 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 we created the first Clifford algebra. And now Clifford algebra is the way we can in fact imagine a quantity can be embedded into a higher dimensionality without being extended into one. Effective Clifford algebra is an endless number of quaternion systems, each anti-commutative to each other, with a uh, complexity added or not as you choose. But by going down this route, we've crossed the Rubicon. The dimensionality is now much more problematic if we redefine it in a more problematic way. It's no longer simple, but also compounded, and simple answers to questions yield multiple interpretations. Even space itself gives us a problem. We've explained space is dimensions, we've got it as unit one, but we've, but we've got a problem with it. This is a classic example of the Minkowski four-dimensional space-time. And this is what is called a full vector. It's a vector and a pseudo-scalar unit representing time. And we can imagine creating it by multiplying the quaternion units by the pseudo scalar units. So it has four dimensions, if you like. And it's like widely claimed to be a breakthrough concept. And of course, it is a very important concept, a very useful one. However, there are problems with it. It's not obvious why there are only four dimensions. Because the algebra isn't possible without also having the scalar. We define the algebra to be the vector plus the pseudo scalar, but it doesn't make sense algebraically without the scalar. So really, shouldn't we have five dimensions? And it's not obvious why we couldn't have started from the quaternions and added the, the, the pseudo-scalar. Why we had to start with the vectors? Obviously, to explain the space we need, but we need to have started from them. So there are two possible ways of defining it. And it also, is it really four, is it really five? And the pseudo-scalar used in the combination is time whereas space has its own pseudo-scalar, which is volume. It doesn't need another pseudo-scalar. So we've added a pseudo-scalar externally to it. So it's not just a mathematical issue, because there are real problems with four-dimensional space-time. It's a very useful concept, as long as we realize we've got problems with it. But Minkowski is famous quote, henceforth space by itself, time by itself, doomed to fade away into mischief, and only kind of union of the two will be in independent reality. Well, I don't accept that that's true at all. The, the mathematical union doesn't disguise the fact that there are major physical differences. It's a good mathematical union, but it's a mathematical union, not a truly physical one. Wave-particle duality, essentially, we either go down the space route or the time route, whichever we do, we choose one or the other, because we've said that there's a physical union as well as a mathematical union, which there isn't. Uh, general relativity becomes in incompatible with quantum mechanics because it treats time as just another dimension of space, but quantum mechanics requires different, special differences. Time and quantum mechanics isn't an observable. But suddenly we've got um, a problem because general relativity wants it to be incorporated in space as a, a real fourth dimension. 
Penrose's twisters is another one, four rail units, four imaginary. Really sounds like a very good idea. But he assumes a, a real four dimensionality, and it means he can't put, generate particle structures. Again, relativistic quantum mechanics doesn't actually use four vectors at all, as I'll show later. It uses something a bit more subtle. It uses four vectors embedded into something else. So it's not, it doesn't carry over as simply as people think. You, you need a higher Clifford algebra to, to be able to do it in the Dirac equation. So I've already said what uh, uh, Clifford algebra was. Once we've established the co combinations of these steps, then any level dimensional also becomes mathematically possible and related to physics. But the concept of dimensionality then becomes ambiguous because the dimensionalities are not necessarily unique. You see, Clifford algebra is only possible because community makes it possible that everything, sorry, uh, so we've got sev several sets of dimensions which we put together and it, we can do that. The, the multiple sets of, will be defined by the uniqueness of the partnerships within them but not external to them. Now the result is an extension of the concept of the dimensionality at the same time as denying its uniqueness. This is a typical Clifford algebra of G, and the G is also geometrical algebra, it's another name for it. M or N, N is the number of units with plus one. N is the number of units with minus one, norm. And for example, let's say we take this one, three, two. This is an algebra with five dimensions. But any norm one object could be made up from two objects with norm minus one. You could easily do it. So the algebra might be reconstructed as two, four. Right? We take one of, off that and add two onto that. So this is now six dimensions. And it's exactly the same algebra. It does the same job. So, but it's, it's ambiguous. So Clifford algebra allows us to do this, but it doesn't allow us to extend our 3D space into more dimensions. I've already gone through that. So if there's a deeper level of meaning in dimensionality, it can't come from space alone, because we can't extend our space into these dimensions. It must come from something else. And I'm saying it's coming from those parameters which exist at the same fundamental level of space and time. And uh, I've worked on this for a very long time, and to, me, to, to my understanding, there are only two other parameters of that order. One is mass or mass energy, and the other one is charge, which is the source of the strong and weak electric interactions. And this is the Klein formula that I found long ago that served this the purpose of uh, uniting these things in a symmetry uh, uh, rather than a, a, an individual unification but a symmetry. Um, this is a diagram that my colleague Vanessa Hill did at my request showing the interrelationships between these various things. And, and after 30, 40 years testing I've never found any exception to this symmetry. But I've always found it true. So these exhibit paired dualities with each other. And these dualities can be expressed in an algebraic way. That's the interesting thing. Two of the dualities are real and imaginary. We go back to that. Real and imaginary. Real numbers, imaginary numbers, whatever. No one and no minus one. The, the, a second one is commutative and non-commutative, anti-commutative in fact, and that's obvious as well. And the third one, conserved and non-conserved, is almost a, certainly in this category. And I think it's the the ones that have the extra pseudo scalar, that are the non-conserved ones. So if we do that, we can construct these parameters to have these algebras, and these are the sub-algebras related to the parameters. So you've got scalar, complex, quaternions, and multivariate vectors. And uh, my understanding is that there isn't any other information in physics other than what can be got from that. So this is where the source of dimensionality of any extra kind has to come. So charge now becomes identical as the place where the quaternion algebra is already present in nature. Uh, is directly present. Well, we, we, we had quaternions before we knew what to do with them, just like we had the laser before we knew what to do with it. But we couldn't manage without it now. I think the same is true with quaternions. But I think they find their home in, in the <coughs> representation of charge and mass. It has its own scalar part, but it can be combined with mass as the scalar. Again, it's got its own scalar. Its scalar is it simply its, uh, its scalar values of the charges, but, but it's, um, 
it can be combined with mass in a new four dimensional algebra, which in, in the same way as we combined time and space. So we got a mass charge similar to space time. Uh, but it's not so simple as we think. We might think at first it's yet another problem uh, because a more complicated structure again is required. Uh, yes, the, the, there is also a difference in that these quantities are conserved. They don't have that rotation symmetry and uh, affine structure that the other, uh, that the non-conserved ones uh, have. So we can actually write it all down in the language of Clifford algebra that way. So th th this is the Clifford algebra language, but th this is the alternative languages from which they could have been derived. Now we, we can also set it out like that, and we can. There's a th the thing I was mentioning uh, a couple of days ago that we, if we combine these three together, then we get another space because multiplying that by that gives us that. And so that is another way of representing it, a space and an empty space, if you like. But in either case, you get a group of order 64, and we've seen this group, how it operates. Um, is there any physical counterpart to this multiplication that you're talking about? I mean, you constantly say I'm multiplying and then I'm creating something. Yeah, I'm, I'm multiplying the units together. Yeah. Yes, I think there is. Um, there are various ones of particle structures and things like that, you know, have relevance in this regard. Let me add one. Yeah. You can start law. Okay. Well, we, we, can we talk about that after? Then we pick up, yeah. um, When we get some proper coffee. Uh, we can, <laughs> if you like, you can take these eight basic units as eight dimensions. So that's a, another way of looking at it. You've got eight dimensions. Of course, that's all been a favorite for a long time, trying eight dimensions. And these can be mapped onto an octonium. And you can, you can say, I, I, I can multiply that by the complex number and use the quaternion bits of this. And then I've got seven uh, imaginary numbers and one real one. And you can map them onto an octonium. And the interesting thing is that, relevant to your question, is that the, the bits that uh, are anti-associative are, are the bits that don't matter in physics when you do that. So this is what you might call a broken octonium. It's a, it's a broken symmetry. It's not. And then we've done this before. This is the group of order 64 with all those units. And again, there's another one. It's biology. All these have any significance in biology is from my first talk in this conference. And that's the, the vector quaternion version, and that's the double quaternion version. Now, the, the other thing to do is to, to see how these are all groups and they have generators and to actually how do we create the minimum number of generators well the classic way is to take one of these two three dimensionalities and stick it on the other five parameters so we get that we get that structure comes out now that structure is a is like a five dimensional structure so this is classic Clifford algebra eight dimensions in one sense five dimensions in another so we got five dimensions there uh, two things result from this. We actually generate the new quantities that we now call energy, quantized energy, quantized momentum, and quantized rest mass. So these are the new uh, quantities that didn't exist. And at the same time, so that's the, the non-red bits in these have been transformed by connection with a red bit. The red bits have been transformed by connection with the other bits so that they now show these broken, these symmetries and it breaks the symmetry between the three charges. So this one is now an SU2 structure, SU3 structure and a U1 structure. Weak charge, strong charge, electric charge. And that's because we've uh, taken the generators. So these mappings tell us something profound about the nature of physics. Classical physics, classically physics, can be constructed from a phase space. And this is another concept of dimensionality. Six-dimensional phase space or eight-dimensional phase space time with three units of space and three units of the conjugate momentum. So we've got space there and we've got momentum there. So this all together creates the phase space. However, what you notice is that those are not totally dependent of each other. You can see that the space and the momentum are not, not independent of each other. And hence why they're not commutative. Only commutative things can be independent of each other. So, We see the quantities are only partially independent. The charge part of the unit is independent of space-time, but the rest is not. 
So the consequence is not commutative to the quantum level between energy and time, momentum, and space. Phase be space becomes a reflection of the high dimensionality of the group, but only a partial one. So by symmetry, we want to set up partial parallel relations between energy and weak charge, momentum, strong charge, and mass mass electric charge, and momentum charge in general. In fact, all those are evident. Thank you. In some way or other. Uh, so we put. We can now factorize, I've done this before, we get the no potent structure with the square root of zero. So this object in its quantum mechanical form is, the, in my view, the most fundamental in physics. Okay? And its dimensionality has got to be the dimensionality that really interests us. This is clearly five dimensional, but it's also two lots of five dimensional. The red bits and the other bits. So in another sense, it's ten dimensional. Okay. Now the theories of inclusive planet define a fifth dimension to be added to space and time, and that's precisely what we're getting. We're getting that, or the charge version of it. And the two theories uh, use them to generate that rest mass and, and charge. So we can actually, if we want to, define the Fermi as a ten-dimensional object with six of the dimensions carrying information. Uh, can conserve the information and therefore, in, the, in that sense, be compactified. According to the string theory, light cone quantization and Lorentz invariance, which is exactly what define the third family, require the number of spaced time dimensions to be 10. And I think we may be able to see some sort of reason why that's true. Uh, an interesting thing is John Byers has put forward a model of string theory in which 10 dimensions have been grown as two dimensions of space time string within an Octonian space. I don't think it's strictly true because you'd have to have two lots of time and you've got anti-associativity and things like that, but there's a sort of element of truth in it. We can regard our ten-dimensional representation of the null bottom as a string theory without strings. It's got the symmetries, but it's not got the, the uh, model-dependent bit. A co colleague of mine described a perfect string theory as one in which self-duality and phase space determines vacuum selection, an ideal description of what the Fermi null bottom is. Okay, but it's not just a ten-dimensional object, as I said, it's ambiguous when you get to this level. So you can have, because it's a nil potent, the fifth dimension is in a sense redundant. So you can actually reduce it to five dimensions, ten dimensions, four dimensions, eight dimensions. It's even three dimensions if you take, just take the red bits. And it's six dimensions from the application of the double space. Uh, we could actually also, can, uh, look at that as one object, and that as one object, and then it's two dimensions, it's the area aspect, as, a, as you get it with the holographic principle. And of course the hol holographic principle is about, um, if you use projective geometry, areas and lines that are equivalent, so it's even one dimensional. So you can have any dimensional reality you want. This is the only comment I found of any use on that, that, that we, we related projective and, uh, and uh, ordinary spaces, yeah, um, because you get an extra dimension with projective spaces, so you can do the fill of using ordinary and projective spaces. Lots of other ways you can introduce higher dimensions into physics, I think I'll leave those out, um, bosons and so on. Uh, so I'm just going to summarise now, dimensions are looking at use of numbers for observation, I did. Can I ask one question? Yeah. If you had Bragg diffraction, which, which, what are the maximum number of dimensions that you could have Bragg diffraction? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'll have to think about that one. Dimensions of the use of numbers for observation and the existence of an infinite ladder of Pythagorean numbers to apply the means of defining orthogonality, in which square numbers are added where regular numbers aren't. That's what we mean by orthogonality. Well, there are two special processes which do that, duality and anti-commutativity. Uh, after the application of these processes, high dimensionality can be created. And you can get up to 10, you can get up to 11, you can get up to anything you want. But the results are necessarily ambiguous and open to more than one interpretation. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the class?